So the whole purpose of having these relationships in this family structure, where two people of opposite genders come together, put aside their differences, and, and work and complement one another's strengths, and then eventually procreate to have children to where there is a father and son or a father and daughter or you know multiple occasions of both. The fact that those roles are different and complementary, they're all supposed to teach us about our relationship with God. That's the purpose of it all. And once you can explain that to people, that this is intentional, that this wasn't just an accident or just God doing it on a whim without a plan for it, once you can get that across to a person, that's how you win the argument. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our chaplain's report today comes from the book of Genesis, and when we're in tumultuous times like this, whenever you find yourself in a storm, whenever a society is trying to alter everything, that's the reason we have the scripture. You go back to the basics, back to the origin. That's your anchor. That's your point zero zero. That's how you steady yourself and get your bearings. And I think that it's time for us to go back to that and, and go back to the very origin of scripture itself. Let's go back all the way to the beginning. Genesis 1, 1, or sorry, Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the livestock, and over the earth, and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. All right, so we learn two things about the nature of humankind from that verse. First, we are made in God's image. Because we are made in God's image, we have dominion over every creature that God made that is not made in God's image. Cattle, birds, etc., etc. So that's the first thing we learn about humanity. When we understand what the biblical worldview of what is a human and what a human is supposed to be, that's the first thing we're supposed to understand is not only are we creatures that God made, but we are creatures that God made specifically for a purpose, and he did so by making us in his image. We are wrought in the image of God. That's the first thing, and it's first because it's the most important. But what's the second assertion he makes? He created them male and female. He didn't just create man. I mean, obviously he created man first, but he didn't just create man. He created man, and then he created woman. And so the very second thing that we learn about humanity in the entire Bible, and by extension the history of the entire human race, is that we're separated into two genders, male and female. And this is not a trivial matter, and I think part of the reason that God includes this and includes it so emphatically is because... He knew that times like this would happen. And by the way, this is not necessarily a new thing. There have been other societies that became weirdly obsessed with homosexuality and androgyny. And so this is really just a greatest hits album from hell. That's, that's the best, best way to describe it, is we're, we're not really dealing with a new problem. We're dealing with a new manifestation of an old problem. And this is something that has always been an issue. Because other than being made in the image of God, which, granted, that's been attacked quite a bit in society as well, the thing that we know most about ourselves is that we're either male or female. It's the very first thing that somebody notices when you're born. Oh, is, do we have a boy or do we have a girl? Oh, looks like we have a girl. Once they take that away, they can take anything away. That's the issue here. You see, to have rights, they have to come from God. 
The left tends to not believe this. They think that rights are given to you by the government, which defeats the purpose of having rights. If the government is what bestows rights upon you, then you don't actually have rights. You have a set of privileges that government gives to you and can take away from you at any time. The whole purpose of rights is that they're inalienable. This is what our founders believed. And how do we know that they are inalienable? What gives us the ability to say to other people, no, I don't care what you want. I have the right given to me. Well, it's that it is something that is inborn, in other words, part of you from creation, and it is given to you by God. See, the left has been attacking this for years, and this is one of the ways to do that. They've attacked the first assertion, that you are a being that is created in God's image, and because of that, that comes with certain rights and certain responsibilities that coincide with one another to live and exist. That's what it means to be a human being. But if they can get you to reject the second assertion that the Bible makes, that mankind is separated into two genders, male and female, they can get you to deny pretty much anything. It's one of the most fundamental things about being a human, is that you know you're either a man or a woman. And once they have robbed you of that, once they can get you to say, no, I'm really a woman, or no, that person who obviously is a dude is really a woman, once they can get you to say that, they can get you to say anything. And that's the point. George Orwell, 1984. Do you remember what the assertion was that they forced Wilson, the main character, to make at the end of the book to, to change him from being the rebellious spirit who rebelled against the party to being one of them? You remember what they had to, they made him say? Two plus two equals five. Why did they make him say that? What was so important about getting him to say, yes, I agree, 2 plus 2 equals 5? Because the point of that whole thing was if we can get you to say that 2 plus 2 equals 5, there is literally no idea we can't insert into you and force you to believe. Once you say that, once you have abandoned any kind of objectivity, any kind of moral standard, any belief in truth other than the truth of what we tell you is truth, then we can make you do anything. Once that happens, you're just another cog in the machine. And that's exactly why they are trying to get you to deny the most basic part of your existence. One, that you're created in the image of a creator. And two, that you're either a male or a female. Once they can get you to abandon that, they can get you to abandon anything else. Once you have thrown that away, then it doesn't matter what it is. They can insert it into you and make you believe it and, and make you say and actually think that it is true. That's the reason this battle is so important. You know, I actually got into a debate with somebody earlier about the Satan shoe. You may remember that there was a, a rapper who is a gay guy and he did a music video about him like pole dancing into hell and giving Satan a lap dance. No, I'm, I'm dead serious. This is actually going on in it. And to commemorate this, he repurposed a shoe and uh, put satanic symbols on it and it's like made with real human blood and he made 666 out. so all this ridiculous satanic stuff and i do think that it's important to to point out evil when we see it but the truth is our job is not as simple as that most of the time i mean yeah a guy putting satanic symbols on a shoe and and you know symbolically giving satan a lap dance it's pretty easy to tell that that's evil. Like, we're not really breaking new ground, pointing at that, going, hey, that's not good. Most of the average people can see that that's evil. And so, I'm not saying that we don't do that, because I think it's... I, actually, I was on the side of saying that it is correct to bring up when evil happens, no matter when it happens. I'm just saying, with that one, it's a lot more obvious. You see, this stuff is the stuff that's more subtle. Granted, this isn't a real subtle example of it, but it's important for us to fight these battles because if they can get society as a whole to agree that somebody that was born with male parts and has XY chromosomes in literally every cell of his body and look at that and go, yep, that's a woman and look how brave and beautiful she is. Well, then we've lost the battle because then they can convince them to think anything. They can convince them to think that God isn't real or that God is... I don't know, some kind of lesbian spiritual overlord, like they, they can, or a, a giant space beaver, like they can make them believe anything, no matter how ridiculous 
or blasphemous it is at that point. And that's why it's important that we do not lose this fight, because if we lose the fight on people being able to assert basic and very obvious truths, then we won't be able to win any other battle ever again. And I think the reason that we also have to keep this in mind is it's important to inform people when we do have them ask questions about this is we have to ask the question of why. Why did God make us this way? Because if we can answer that question, then gender isn't just this arbitrary thing that God kind of sprung on us and then it's not just a religious idea. Well, there's countless reasons and I could probably do an entire chaplain's report just on those. But the fact that God intentionally made us into men and women, that's not an arbitrary thing. Why did God choose to do that? Because he could have made us any way he wanted. He's God. He's all-powerful. He could have made us in any way. He could have made it to where we didn't have to have sex to reproduce, that you know we, we wouldn't be separated into genders. He could have made it to where... Uh, we reproduce in a way that, you know, you don't have to have two separate genders, that we're all the same and you can just mix our DNA uh, regardless of who we are and then we can create offspring. He could have created us basically like giant cells that we just, you know, eat enough and have enough energy and then we divide into two separate parts. Like, he could have made us any way he wanted. Why did he choose a system where half of us are men, half of us are women, and we have to enter into a relationship with one another to be able to procreate. I think it's fairly obvious, isn't it? If you understand the first assertion, you understand the second. God made us in his image. And he made us in his image so that he could love us and that we could love him. That's our purpose. And what helps us in doing that is having a partner. In the same way that, I mean, it's what's asserted in Ephesians 5. It's what's asserted really all throughout the scripture, but especially in the New Testament, with the analogy of the bride in Christ. But this is all through the Old Testament, too. I'm reading through the Minor Prophets right now. Hosea is a great example of this. Uh, Ezekiel does this quite a bit, too, referring to God's people as being an adulterous wife because they've gone off and worshipped other gods. In the New Testament, Christ is the husband of the church, and men are supposed to love their wives just like Christ loved the church, and women are supposed to love their husbands and respect him and submit to their authority just like the church is supposed to do the same thing with Jesus. It's the same kind of relationship. So the whole purpose of having these relationships in this family structure, where two people of opposite genders come together, put aside their differences, and, and work and complement one another's strengths, and then eventually procreate to have children to where there is a father and son or a father and daughter or, you know, multiple occasions of both. The fact that those roles are different and complementary, they're all supposed to teach us about our relationship with God. That's the purpose of it all. And once you can explain that to people, that this is intentional, that this wasn't just an accident or just God doing it on a whim without a plan for it, once you can get that across to a person... That's how you win the argument. You don't win it by just saying, and I know that most people don't do this anyway, but you don't win it just by saying, well, it's wrong, and that's the end of the story. Yes, it is wrong, but you have to explain why it is wrong. And more importantly, you have to explain why your view is correct, why God's intention for that is correct and good. And once people understand that, they're not going to buy in to the idea that men and women are just arbitrary constructs and interchangeable. Ultimately, when you boil it all down, all sin is a rejection of who you were meant to be. That's what transgenderism is. It's God saying, all right, you're a man. And then you saying to God, no, I don't like your decision. I'm going to make my own decision. I get to be my own God. I've decided I'm going to be a woman or vice versa. That's what all sin is. Because God intended every single one of us to conform to the image of his Son. God desires all men to repent and to be saved. God wants all of us to be his. And that's the intention he had for each and every one of us when he made us. He didn't make any of us with the intention of us to rebel against him. He made all of us knowing that each one of us, made in his image, has the potential to be a son or a daughter to him. That's our purpose. 
And so regardless of what the sin is, whether it's transgenderism, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's lying, whether it's adultery, regardless, I mean, you could name off any sin in the Bible. Every single one of them is a sin because it is a rejection of who God made us to be. It is saying to God, no, I don't like your plan for me. I don't like the way that you made me. I'm going to do my own thing and, and lean on my own understanding. That's why this is so important, because just like every other sin, transgenderism is a rejection of yourself on the fundamental level. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.